So, it turns out everyone hates Final Fantasy 2. Well, maybe hate is a bit harsh, but if you're into Final Fantasy, you probably know what I mean. If you watch YouTube videos about this game, or read reviews of it, you'll struggle to find many people being positive about it. If you google something along the lines of best Final Fantasy games, or Final Fantasy games ranked, you'll find Final Fantasy 2 either right at the bottom or near the bottom of pretty much every list there is. This is a really interesting place to approach analysing a game from. This game is probably the most universally reviled entry within the entire Final Fantasy series, and I think it would be very easy to fall into the trap of mimicking the general consensus from the get-go. But the whole point of this video is that we're going to take a close look at as much of the game as we can, instead of cherry-picking and focusing on its faults. So here's where I'm going to give you the requisite spoiler warning. This is, unsurprisingly, the second video in this series, in which I'm going to be taking a long look at pretty much every Final Fantasy game, and in case you've come here after having watched my Final Fantasy 1 video, I'd just like to say that every one of these games is different, and as such will be analysed in different ways. This video will take a different approach to Final Fantasy 1, both in terms of content and structure. The very basic idea with which I'd like to approach this analysis is very simple. Is the treatment that this game receives fair? And to start looking into this, we'll need to take a brief look at the complexities surrounding Final Fantasy II's development. Final Fantasy II was released on the 17th of December 1988. For context, the first game in the series was released on the 18th of December 1987. This wasn't a very long turnover, and halfway through the development, lead programmer Nasir Gabelli's work visa expired, which meant that some of the game's development had to be done outside of Japan. This seems like it would have really thrown a spanner in the works, but when it was all done, Famitsu ended up giving the game a 35 out of 40, which is pretty favourable. The messier parts of Final Fantasy II's history come from a predominantly English language perspective. It was 1990 when the original translation of Final Fantasy I finally came out in the US, around two and a half years after its initial Japanese release. And after it proved a success, work began on localising Final Fantasy II. Decent progress was made on this, and a prototype beta version of the localised game was made, but eventually, Square made the decision to scrap work on Final Fantasy II, and instead prioritise an English localization of Final Fantasy IV, the first Final Fantasy game on the SNES. This is where it gets complicated. Because Final Fantasy IV was only the second Final Fantasy game released in the West, it was named Final Fantasy II, in an attempt to mitigate any confusion. Final Fantasy VI would also eventually become Final Fantasy III in the US. Unsurprisingly, this has caused mass confusion ever since. But the point is, it was 2003, 15 years after Final Fantasy II's initial Japanese release, that we finally got an official, translated English language version of the game, which was Final Fantasy Origins on the PS1. In the Final Fantasy I video, I focused mostly on the NES version, because it was the original version of the game and I only used the PSP version as a way of cross-referencing, or for additional clarification if needed. For Final Fantasy II, there technically isn't an official English language NES version of the game, and even though you can find some really decent fan translations or play the prototype, I wanted to predominantly focus on an official Square licensed translation of the game. For this reason, we'll be almost exclusively focusing on the PSP version of Final Fantasy II. If you wanted to play this game in English, and legitimately, you have the choice between Origins on the PS1, Dawn of Souls on the GBA, and the 20th Anniversary Edition on the PSP. I talk more about the version differences early on in the Final Fantasy 1 video, so you can actually check that bit out if you want, but the long and short of it is that you're best either picking GBA or PSP. Just go with whichever is easier to get hold of, or whichever you prefer from a visual perspective. Right, so finally we can get down to business. What is Final Fantasy 2, and does it deserve its reputation? To answer and consequently build upon that hypothetical question, we'll need to start taking a look at the game. As always, best to start at the beginning and provide a bit of context before we head into the nitty gritty. Unlike Final Fantasy 1, where you choose your characters, you start this game with a fixed party. W well, sort of. Final Fantasy 2 begins with your main party on the run, after their home was destroyed by an evil empire. Your party consists of Firion, Maria, Guy, and Leon. Eventually, you find yourself in the base of the Rebel Army, a group dedicated to resistance against the tyranny of the Empire, and you make it your mission to help them achieve their goals. That's the beginning of the game summed up about as simply as possible. So, like I said right at the start, 
If you read about this game, or watch other videos about this game, or if you've ever dipped your toes into the stagnant pool that is Final Fantasy II Discourse, you might know the primary reason for the aforementioned disdain that is so often pointed towards it. After all, it is basically the only thing people focus on when discussing Final Fantasy II, so I'm just going to get it out of the way first, so we can see what all the fuss is about, and then move on to the myriad other things that this game has to offer. So yeah, some people do harbour serious contempt for this game, and let's dive into why. Firstly, we'll start this by taking a tiny look back at the levelling system in Final Fantasy 1. You beat enemies, get experience, and when you reach a certain threshold, you level up. When you leveled up, your stats increased, and in turn, you became stronger. This idea is, to this day, the backbone of the standard JRPG. Obviously, modern deviations of this idea exist, and even within the Final Fantasy series you can find entries that forgo this system, Final Fantasy X most notably. But the first entry to really push the boat out was this one. Final Fantasy II's levelling system was a brave experiment, albeit one that was ultimately never going to totally succeed. In Final Fantasy II, there are no character levels. You don't go from level 1 to level 2, for example. However, just about everything else has a level. You have levels for each type of weapon, and you have levels for each individual magic spell. The way you level these up is by using them, repeatedly. If you want your sword level to increase, use swords in battle. You want your fire spell to go up a level? You get the idea. I actually think it's a relatively nice idea in concept, and you can see a decently well-polished offshoot of this in the Elder Scrolls games, for example. However, as far as Final Fantasy II is concerned, this is only half the battle. When you leveled up in Final Fantasy I, your stats increased. So how does Final Fantasy II have you increase your stats if there's no levels? Well, each stat is linked to an action that you can take or receive in battle. If you want your HP to increase, you need to take damage. If you want your strength stat to increase, you need to attack enemies. You get how it works. There are over 10 stats, each requiring individual criteria to increase. Each weapon and spell has a maximum level of 16, which is higher than it sounds. It's all just too much. The idea is way too big for the game. It's funny because when I write it out and explain it, I don't hate the idea. It actually sounds quite engaging, but when it's put into practice within Final Fantasy II, it just seems... I don't know, like it doesn't fit. Part of the issue is the sheer amount of time it takes to level up your weapons and spells. Apart from for 15 minutes right at the start, I made a point of not grinding during the game. However, I did fight pretty much every battle I happened upon, both in the overworld and in dungeons. From doing this, I got some of my weapons to level 10, and one of my spells to level 11. The problem was that I felt like I could only really use one or two weapon types per character, as opposed to the free-flowing customizability that the game seems to offer. I only ever used a sword and shield as Firion, for example, because I was always quite wary of my level dropping below what would be necessary, but also how much weaker I'd be if I picked up something else. As for spells, I had a few spells that I used quite regularly, like Cure, and some offensive spells too, like Fire and Thunder, but despite having pretty much every spell in the game, I found that I seldom used most of them. Part of the reason for this is that the efficacy of the spell would often directly correlate to its level, which means, and it's mental to say this, but spells like Isuna, which heals negative status effects, in case you don't know, would often miss, because the spell wasn't a high enough level. So, if I wanted to get it to a high enough level, I'd have to sit there wasting turns casting Asuna over and over on healthy party members until it was high enough. Also, when spells level up, the MP cost also increases to match the level of the spell, which can make using some spells pretty expensive. Additionally, when it comes to stat increases, the game counts party members attacking each other as being sufficient to raise HP for example, which is also, unfortunately, the most reliable way of doing so. I hate to say it, but it's honestly just not very well integrated. It reminds me of when I did a video about I Am Setsuna a few years back. In that instance, they were mimicking Chrono Trigger, but the biggest failing was that the game had very simple, thoughtless combat, with so much extraneous depth to it that it made the whole battle system seem really confused. In a game like this, trying to manage weapon levels, spell levels, and getting stat increases by trying to artificially manipulate battles, seems almost unnecessary, when pretty much the only thing you need to do is keep your equipment up to date, and have some basic curative and offensive spells. I am aware that I'm speaking primarily about the PSP version here, the difficulty of which has been modified compared to the original version, but the point does still stand that most of the frills and features surrounding the battle system are either superfluous or overcomplicated. 
You want it to be like if there was a JRPG combat equivalent of Chekhov's gun, really. The best battle systems are ones with the least amount of superfluity in their makeup. Complexity is welcome, but only if it's sufficiently well balanced to make use of what's available. Final Fantasy II's battle system and progression system would both benefit from leaning into the idea of being a bit more streamlined and simple, as opposed to punching above their weight. Combat in this game is still enjoyable at points, but that comes down more to the fact that the skeleton of it is directly lifted from Final Fantasy I. If you want a closer look at how that system works, you can check out that video, link in the description. But as for Final Fantasy II's new additions, some of them don't quite reach the lofty heights they're aiming for. Okay, so we've discussed that, and it isn't like it's not important, because it is, it's the spine of the game, it's just that discussing it feels so trite and overdone nowadays. It's what pretty much everyone focuses on when they talk about Final Fantasy II, so I want to move on to other things, spend some time with the other elements of the game, and also add another little overarching idea into the mix, something to keep in mind as we go through. We already know that we're going to be looking at stuff with the angle of whether the general negativity surrounding the game is warranted, but I also want to keep another thing in mind when looking at all these points, that thing being Final Fantasy II's steadfast commitment to its primary theme, which is tragedy. Let's go back to the start and take a closer look at what's happening again. Like with the turn-based battle system, the skeleton of the game at this early point is not massively dissimilar to that of Final Fantasy I, and of most future Final Fantasy games. The core idea of the series can be boiled down to a group of friends, usually in their late teens, extinguishing evil at its source using a combination of really big swords and the power of friendship. This is now commonplace within JRPGs, look at nearly any series or any successful standalone game, and there's a pretty good chance that it uses this idea as some sort of foundation. Final Fantasy II is obviously no exception. As I said earlier, the main thing differentiating 1 and 2 from the outset is 2's preset party, which allows for much greater exposition in the early stages. Final Fantasy II's protagonists lost their homes and their parents to the tyranny of the Empire. It's no surprise that the Empire is headed by an evil emperor. Again, if we use the power of retrospect and look at JRPGs from a distance, it is frankly astonishing how many villain figures within the genre can be distilled into either being an evil king, or emperor, or general ruler, or the big one, which is some kind of religious authority. There's reasoning for that, though, and at least in terms of empire, we'll go into why later in this video. But yeah, the typical JRPG party structure and villain stereotypes were set up for the future, at least in part, by Final Fantasy II. Having characters with pre-existing motivation is such a boon for setting up a story that engages you quickly. As soon as your party members have their first proper conversation, even though it's very straightforward, you gain an immediate idea of the direction the game is going to take, and the tone that's going to pervade it. From the off, we know that one of our party members, Leon, is missing, and that the Empire is building something called a Dreadnought, which upon its completion will spell the end for the Rebels. As expository dialogue and setup goes, there's nothing to complain about here. Before we've even really started, we already have two vague aims, without concretely being told what to do. The Dreadnought needs to be stopped, and you need to find your pal. You learn that the person leading the Rebel army is a princess called Hilda, who is serving in her ill father's stead. In these opening stages, you get to speak to a few other named NPCs, and you quickly learn something about how Final Fantasy II approaches characterization. It's actually really fascinating, and pretty bizarre, because this game does the antithesis of what you'd expect, in that it fleshes out important NPCs, as opposed to your actual party members. Most games would be inclined to do that the other way around, because, well, that makes more sense, right? Well, maybe not. Let's look at it from this angle. One of the most important things when starting a JRPG is that the world feels like it existed before you arrived. It feels jarring when these games are too egocentric and everything revolves around you. You want your main characters and side characters both to be interesting before you turn up as a player. Let's use Gordon as an example. We'll see plenty of Gordon through the story, but in the opening stages from one conversation, we understand a bit about who he is, his feelings, his brother, and his relationship with Princess Hilda. Obviously, as you'd expect, Gordon develops and grows as a character throughout the game, eventually overcoming his craven nature to lead the Rebel army. The crazy thing is that if we look at Firion, the main character of Final Fantasy II, we learn less about him throughout the span of the entire game than we do about Gordon in this one offhand conversation at the start. That is so ridiculous a concept that it almost sounds like a lie, 
but it's honestly true, and pretty much the same for Maria and Guy. Perhaps Square wanted to give the player the impression that they could project themselves onto the protagonists, despite them being named characters. Or perhaps it would allow the players to form more direct bonds with other characters in the game, as opposed to using Furion as a proxy. Either way, it did this by limiting the progression of your main party, and making their dialogue really wooden. All that being said, I don't dislike that the story is told in a slightly different way to what's become the norm. If we think back to what I said earlier about Final Fantasy II's main theme being tragedy, it actually kind of makes sense to have most major character development outside of the party. This way, you're forced to engage a lot more with the suffering of others, as opposed to just your own. To add on from this, I'd like to look at how a few other of the things that happen early in the game help develop this theme. The first instance of agency you get in the entirety of Final Fantasy II is a scripted battle against four Black Knights, before you wake up in the Rebel base. Bear in mind, the context of this battle is that you're fleeing your home, not trying to start a fight. The enemies dispose of you uncomfortably quickly, your party unable to show any resistance. Narratively, I quite enjoy the fact that they've made it so you have to actually play this part out, as opposed to being passively beaten in a cutscene, for example. Even though it's clearly scripted, the main thing you feel as you watch your party lose is that this is really unfair. Why am I being forced to lose? Personally, I think this is a fantastic starting point because it means that Final Fantasy II has wasted no time setting the tone for the whole game, and for this reason, it's way easier to value this fight retroactively, as opposed to when you first do it. As we'll get into more in the story, Final Fantasy II's world and narrative is really fucked up and unfair. The odds are stacked against you from the start. You're not warriors of light this time, you're refugees. JRPGs are all about progression and improvement, and starting off at a low point that you yourself are made to control is genuinely intelligent planning. Another wee example from the start. If you engage with one of the roaming enemy soldiers on your first trip back to Finn, the place you were fleeing from at the beginning, you'll get obliterated. It's a basic idea, but the game does a lot to reinforce the helplessness inherent to the rebel struggle. Your first mission in the game, and if you try to fight, you're dead. After the Black Knights, then this, the gulf between your abilities and the power of the Empire is beyond immense. Sets up the idea that if you manage to pull this off by the end, it would be nothing short of a miracle. It makes you want to do it, though. One final example. The early death of a character called Scott, who coincidentally is a prince and Gordon's older brother, sets off a chain reaction of misery, perfectly encapsulating the tone that Final Fantasy II tries to develop. Shortly before his death, he asks you to pass on a message to Princess Hilda. He asks you to tell her that he loves her, before deciding it will hurt her too much. When you show Hilda his ring and inform her of his death, she asks if he said anything. Taking the time to speak to the king afterwards adds more fuel to this depressing fire, by letting you know that he had proposed to Hilda, and now would never hear her answer. The combination of her expression in her character portrait and the tentative manner in which she spoke in response to this packs a pretty significant emotional punch. There's heft and weight behind this element of the narrative already, which is to be commended. The ellipses in Firion's response shows that there was a certain amount of reluctance to obey Scott's request to try and comfort Hilda, who's clearly distraught by the news. It is beyond refreshing to see nuance like this at such an early stage, especially in a game initially released in 1988. It's simple, but this is all games really need to do to make you care. In using the perspective of three separate characters, Scott on his deathbed, Hilda and her response to his death, and then the king and his empathy towards his daughter, we have a simple but efficient little tragedy on our hands. The first of many. It makes you feel bad for everyone involved. As we'll see, it isn't just Scott who passes away during the game. There's an arguably abnormal amount of character deaths in Final Fantasy II, ranging from poor nameless NPCs who've been massacred to primary characters and part-time party members. Despite being disheartening to a fault, they made the right call in doing this. A conflict of this scale, facing off against an all-powerful despot and his infinite resources, is not going to be without its casualties. Some deaths are more believable and emotional than others, and some are certainly more dignified, but what matters is that you really feel the loss of these characters on a personal level, rather than just mirroring emotions shown by your main party. It shows you that heroism and bravery isn't always glamorous, which I really like as a message. War isn't pretty, and it should never be rendered as such. I'm aware that almost everything we've just discussed falls into the narrative and thematic categories, 
so I think we should head back to some of the more interactive gameplay features independent to this game. Let's have a look at one of Final Fantasy II's most defining characteristics, the keyword system, or key terms, whatever you want to call it. The keyword system in Final Fantasy II is something entirely novel, and serves as the main way of obtaining information from NPCs throughout the game. The idea is that you can learn certain words during conversations, and ask people about those keywords. That's about it. Looking into this a bit deeper is difficult, because there isn't really that much depth to go into. There are 15 of these terms to learn through the game, and a lot of the instances in which you use them are very straightforward. You get a word, use it once or twice shortly after, and you're done. There are moments where you can get nice bits of flavour dialogue that aren't strictly necessary for progression, but often it serves more so as a way of giving the impression of control and choice to the player. Functionally, there is very little difference between having a character give you the requisite information, and pressing a specific keyword to get that information too. A set of dialogue choices that would require you to choose correctly for info would be a good way of trying to gate dialogue progression behind a keyword system. But what Final Fantasy II has you doing most of the time is either using the most recently acquired keyword, or just running through every available keyword to see which ones people will reply to. You know that if you're given the option to ask something, the NPC will respond to at least one of the keywords. There's little to no nuance to it, despite it being an okay idea. It just kind of, you know, is. That being said, the only instance in which I think it works well for its intended purpose is the very first key term you receive which is Wild Rose, the password used between rebels to certify their collective allegiance to the anti-Empire cause. You use this a few times in the early stages of the game to clue in NPCs as to which side you're on, and it adds a certain element of subterfuge to the game, peppering the dialogue with the impression that you're on an important, top-secret mission. It makes you feel valuable, like you're part of a group genuinely vying for fundamental change. The way the system plays out does make it slightly appear as if they had the idea for this system, with the Wild Rose password at the heart of it, and struggle to find equally suitable places for other words. Most other examples seem a bit tacked on, like an afterthought. But that being said, there is a library in a town called Mesidia, where you can go up to a bookshelf and ask about any of the keywords to get a bit of supplementary information or exposition about that thing. It's a nice touch but doesn't justify the existence of the idea past being a useful vetting system for the Rebels. Speaking of the Rebels, part of the idea why it's so easy to align yourself with the Rebel cause comes down to the music that accompanies it. Have a listen. The first time the Rebel Army music plays, you realise that the music in this game is going to be great. Arguably one of Uematsu's best early pieces, this song embodies the hopefulness and ambition of toppling an empire, while also being restrained enough to impart a feeling of wariness and doubt. The song having these two near-identical melodies played back to back, but in such different styles, is a reflection of Final Fantasy II's storytelling. When I spoke about the prelude in Final Fantasy I, I mentioned the highs and lows that accompany every Final Fantasy story, and this idea is perfectly encapsulated within this song, which serves to be, without a doubt, the most iconic song in the game. It has an appeal that no other song in the series had had yet, because it acts not only as an area theme, but also a character theme for Furion and the party, but also as the game's main theme, really. In a game full of twists and turns, the rebel cause, and this song in turn, is just about the only constant. It's no wonder that the song has become so synonymous with Final Fantasy II itself. Weirdly enough, someone else who's become synonymous with the game and often been chosen to represent it in other Final Fantasy spin-off games is the character Minwoo. Minwoo is an important side character in the game who ends up being your first temporary party member. This is a common feature throughout Final Fantasy II, and throughout your journey you'll have a few characters drop in and out of your team, depending on the situation. In terms of the story, Minwoo is a white magic user who acts as Princess Hilda's advisor and right-hand man. He often speaks plainly, but occasionally says something that gives the impression that he has some sort of prescience. I think he's a pretty interesting character. He's the first named mage character in the whole series, as well as being one of the only male white mages or white wizards, whatever you want to call him. Getting Minwoo in your party is great, partly because it means that you're finally fully fleshed out and have an established healer in your party, 
but also from a storytelling perspective when you look at the spells he has at his disposal. Minwoo is miles ahead of you. The game lets you know of his prowess, not by telling you, but by showing you, which is a nice touch. Part of Minwoo's appeal is the mystery surrounding him, so it makes so much more sense for you to discover his abilities firsthand, rather than being told and having the illusion broken. As for other characters who join your party, the next one is Joseph. Here he is. He's a big, cynical, punchy bald man. When you start interacting more with Joseph, you realise the extent to which Final Fantasy II's story is told through all of these additional characters. Initially, he's very reluctant to believe what you tell him about being with the rebels, but after you save Joseph's kidnapped daughter, he begins to trust you, and ends up saving your life by giving his own. The guy gets crushed by a boulder. Now he's left his family behind, and if you go back and speak to the townspeople, his loss has left a real rift. I mean, you can go speak to his daughter about the fact that he's not coming back. That's pretty dark. There is no point where there's nearly this sort of emotional resonance in plot threads surrounding the main three characters. All of the biggest plot points, all of the emotional heft the game carries, and all of the most interesting dialogue and development comes from the characters around you, like we've been saying. Anyway, let's chuck in a wee bit of levity. After Joseph's death, hold on, maybe maybe that isn't the best choice of words to lighten the mood actually. Nah. Anyway, after Joseph dies, someone in Salaman mentions a weird bird-like creature called a chocobo. This is the first instance in the whole series where a chocobo is mentioned. First off, let's listen to this. So, this is the first instance of the chocobo theme in all of Final Fantasy, and as catchy and jaunty as it is, it's probably the worst one. I still like it, but you'll understand if you know any other future renditions of the song that this feels quite incomplete. A lot of the NES era Final Fantasy songs are short, but this one is really short, being only four bars long before repeating itself. The theme is expanded upon in Final Fantasy 3, and I don't know if I'll speak about it there because I haven't written the video yet but I felt like I had to bring it up here considering the importance of chocobos within the Final Fantasy series. If you don't know, chocobos are large, usually yellow birds that you can tame and ride, and they're probably the most universally recognisable Final Fantasy exclusive export. The person credited with coming up with the idea and design for the chocobo was Koichi Ishii, who's a lot more well known for creating the Mana series, as well as directing Final Fantasy XI in its early years, and plenty of other stuff. However, Sakaguchi has apparently admitted that the inspiration for the chocobo was taken predominantly from the horse claws in Miyazaki's 1984 classic Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. I did some digging on this, and could only find people claiming that Sakaguchi said this, rather than a direct quote from the man himself, but I think the resemblance is pretty close, so I'm inclined to buy into it. There's also a theory that it's based on the Gastornis, a long extinct enormous flightless bird that again shares more than a few characteristics with the chocobo design. Could be it's neither, could be it's both, but it's interesting nonetheless. As for actually finding a chocobo in this game, there's a small, pretty innocuous gap in the forest under a place called Kashuan that it would be pretty easy to not step into, but if you do, it leads you into the first ever chocobo forest. Now, I'm biased, obviously, but I, I love chocobos, I think they're just great. Although the airship is almost always more useful, there's something inherently satisfying about just being able to run about on the land, not having to worry about battles. Given Final Fantasy II's bloated encounter rate, it's actually the best way to explore and get your bearings too. The overworld in Final Fantasy II can occasionally be a bit confusing and unintuitive, so it's relieving to have a chance to traverse the world without facing any untoward consequences. Chocobos are brilliant, and I'm sure we'll be looking at them plenty more as we keep making our way through the games. Now that we've had that little break to discuss something fun, let's return to the abject misery we're accustomed to with Final Fantasy II. I'd like to return to what I mentioned slightly earlier about how Final Fantasy II does a good job of making its world seem lived in, like it doesn't entirely revolve around you, and expand on that slightly. To its benefit, Final Fantasy II wastes no time in integrating you into the smaller struggles of its world, alongside the larger scale ones. Part of the way it does this is through surrounding you with NPCs whose ideals match your own, and story objectives in which you directly see the unfair subjugation of innocent people. It starts off on a more direct, interpersonal level, as most games do, with you rescuing a bartender who's being forced to serve drinks to the people who captured and raised his home. 
and ups the stakes exponentially as the game goes on, to the point where you're trying to save an entire species of dragon after their near obliteration at the hands of the Empire, for example. The ease of understanding of good and bad in this story is really refreshing. Not every story needs to have the nuance of grey areas and morally ambiguous characters. Sometimes that can be replaced with insurmountable odds as a way of introducing drama and conflict. What draws you into Final Fantasy II is the inherent part of you that knows you're the good guys. It would maybe seem obvious that you're the good guys in a Final Fantasy game, but as we'll see through the series, this isn't actually that common in future entries. Most future Final Fantasy games introduce some element of moral ambiguity when it comes to the intentions, or histories, or direct actions of their protagonists and other party members. The same can be said for the villains, too. Whereas future villains in the series have a bit more nuance and character depth, Final Fantasy II's Emperor is just a seriously bad guy who needs sorted out. That's it. This makes Final Fantasy II a standout in some ways. In taking down the Empire, the malevolent force that seems hellbent on leaving ashes in its wake, and consequently the Emperor, an unhinged megalomaniac who would stop at nothing to feel the satisfaction of total domination, you have very little doubt that you are in the right. Let's use the story surrounding the Dreadnought to sum this up. I mentioned that from the very opening stages you got the impression that at some point you're going to have to take down this warship, and that time does eventually come. Around this time you can speak to townspeople, innocent bystanders, who say things like, it's only a matter of time before the Empire kills us and that the Empire hasn't attacked us, at least not yet. The tone is so downtrodden and muted. It seems that regardless of where you go, everyone lives under the heel of the Empire, afraid that each passing day could be their last. On your first attempt, you fail to destroy the Dreadnought, and as you make your way back to Altair, which is where the Rebels are based, and pass by the towns on the way, you can enter and see that they've all been obliterated. I mean, in one of these towns, you can speak to an NPC and he says, they killed my daughter. Something endemic to fascist regimes, like the one being represented in this game by the Empire, is the willingness to kill children. I'll give you fair warning here, but I'm about to talk about some pretty dark stuff. Under these regimes, disgusting acts such as this are justified by twisting socio-political theory. One way it was done is if they're believed to be inherently lesser by way of race, religion, or creed. For example, did you know that an estimated 1.5 million children almost all of them Jewish, were murdered during the Holocaust. If you didn't know that, one thing I'd recommend doing is following the Auschwitz Memorial Museum on Twitter. This was a recent post from them. It's really harrowing to read, but indescribably important. One further nauseating example of this is the way that the concept of social Darwinism, essentially a bastardization of survival of the fittest, has been used as an excuse to murder disabled children under fascist leadership. There's nothing more depressing to me than the fact that there's a Wikipedia page entitled Child Euthanasia in Nazi Germany. As someone with a physical disability, thinking about this makes me feel genuinely sick. I do understand, by the way, just to say, that there might be a chance that you could be watching this thinking something along the lines of, this is just a video game, why are you talking about the Holocaust? And let's look at it this way. The main point I tried to get across in my video a while back about sexualization in Xenoblade 2 was that media is more important than a lot of people think, and the manner in which things and events are represented has a real-life, entirely tangible impact on the world we live in. If women are routinely dehumanized in the media, that self-same treatment will bleed out into the real-world treatment of women. We are little more than malleable clay, really, formed into who we are by the people around us, our real-life experiences, and the media that we engage with. This is why I'm so pleased that Final Fantasy II, as grim and uncomfortable as it is, shows such an unfiltered view of what horrors can be wrought if totalitarianism, fascism, and imperialism go unchecked. So yes, you could say that it's a leap to use the death of one child in a video game to lead into a discussion pertaining to the mass murder of children under the Nazis, but I think that would be willfully missing the point. Representing these ideas in this game is a way of acting as a reminder, an echo, of what's happened in pretty modern history. Final Fantasy II came out in 1988. That's only 43 years after the end of World War II. That is not a long time. This video is being made in 2020, 32 years after Final Fantasy II came out. It isn't like World War II ended and fascism and authoritarianism just died. It would be naive to assume that real life history doesn't have an effect on the media we consume, and vice versa. So yes, as grim as this is, this depiction does the game a real service, and the same can be said for the similar sentiments echoed throughout the series, 
I've seen people levy complaints about Final Fantasy games too often using an empire as its main antagonistic force, but there's a reasoning behind that choice. There is almost nothing more inherently unjust than the mistreatment of innocent children, and having the antagonists of a game indiscriminately kill kids a quarter of the way in is a surefire way to show you just what kind of evil you're up against. This is part of one of Final Fantasy II's strongest suits, and there are a few games I've played that have represented the realities of war and dictatorship in such an unfiltered and honest way. I love the contrast between Final Fantasy 1 and 2, because Final Fantasy 1's whole vibe is one of hopefulness. You're the warriors of light off on a heroic quest, whereas Final Fantasy 2's overarching theme is hopelessness, really. You're only fighting back because you're being forced to. NPCs die, party members die, towns are destroyed, lives are ruined, it's just one thing after another. And for the heavy majority of the game, this happens despite your best efforts. You try, and you get rewarded with tragedy. Because that's how it would actually be, how it has been in real life. I'm so glad that they didn't really pull their punches here because it ends up making Final Fantasy II actually really memorable. Sure, the story doesn't have quite the depth of most later entries, and the character writing could be better, but you can't fault the commitment to, and success of, Final Fantasy II's melancholy theme. If you quickly cast your mind back to that previous section, I mentioned that one of our aims in the game is to save this dragon race, and I'd like to briefly discuss this plot thread now. In Final Fantasy II, there's an island of wyvern-taming warriors called Dragoons. Unfortunately, the Empire decided to commit mass genocide to eliminate this threat to their superiority, and now there's only one Dragoon left, one dying wyvern left, and one wyvern egg left. I'm sure you can see where this is going. So you help hatch this wyvern egg, so that they don't die out, but this does mean that there's still only one, so when that one dies, they will have died out. As for the one dragoon left, it's worth discussing him, but first I get the impression that a lot of Final Fantasy fans who haven't played 2 might not know this, but the dragoon, easily the coolest Final Fantasy class by the way, and my personal favourite, actually comes from this game. It's in Final Fantasy 3 as well, but I think a lot of people think of Final Fantasy 4's Kane as the first dragoon in the series. It turns out it was actually Rickard, whose surname is Highwind, just like other Dragoons later in the series. This is very exciting to me. There's another fun wee bit of Dragoon trivia to do with Rickard, but we'll actually have to wait until the Final Fantasy IV video for that, unfortunately. Something I find interesting from a translation perspective, though, is his first name, and the multiple variations of it in separate versions. In the original Katakana, his name is as you see on screen, Richard Highwind. From there, you can see how we settled upon Rickard. However, in the PS1 Origins version, he's called Gareth. Gareth! It's not even close to the original, it just makes me think he's from Cardiff or something. Also interesting is that in the prototype translation that never saw official release, the one we mentioned at the start, he was called Edward. This one makes a little more sense, as both Richard and Edward are, at least in the UK, historically royal names, which kind of befit a character like him. Square ended up using Edward as a name for royalty later in the series anyway. Again, we'll chat about this more in the Final Fantasy IV video, but Edward's name also wasn't originally Edward in Japanese, it was something else. Fascinating stuff. Interestingly, it's also worth bringing up version differences here to help discuss Dragoon lore a bit. In the original NES version, the Dragoons primarily used swords, which is evidenced by the fact that you get the Dragoon's ultimate weapon, the sword Excalibur, in Dased, where the Dragoons lived. However, as most of you probably know, the iconic Dragoon weapon has undoubtedly become the spear. To reflect this, in later versions of the game, PSP included, Rickard has a high starting level for spears, alongside swords, as opposed to just having sword proficiency, like in the original release. I'm really into this as a retcon of sorts, because most series fans who play Final Fantasy II will play one of the GBA or PSP remakes, and it would be weird to see a Dragoon not using a spear. It's a fun bit of retroactive game design. Anyway, you come across Rickard and he joins your party. Getting him is exciting, because aside from being a Dragoon, he's probably the most tangibly useful of all the additional party members. You have him in the party for a decent amount of time, too. He's my personal favourite addition. However, Final Fantasy II has taught us that good things do not last. Rickard dies to save you, just like Joseph. There's a moment where you think it would be too tragic for him to die, when he gets reunited with a recently hatched Wyvern, and you even get a wee teaser when you summon this Wyvern and it says, Wyvern and Dragoon are together once more. And then Rickard dies not too long after. Really unpleasant stuff. Final Fantasy II throws so much tragedy at you over its story that sometimes it's hard to actually register all of it. Rickard's death in the game signifies the end of an entire culture, the death of traditions, 
yet more history lost to the void of time. At least he gets the best death scene of any character though, his dialogue here is really cool. It's a bit of a shame that your main party members can't manage to say anything interesting about it though. I mentioned it briefly earlier, but the way Firion and Maria speak is really one-dimensional. There's no specific style or traits independent to their characters that would make them recognisable in a conversation. Look at Firion's dialogue here, for example. Very bland. In contrast, almost all of the other characters in the game, especially those who intermittently join your party, have a distinct idiolect. To put it simply, someone's idiolect is just the speech patterns specific to that person, be it through vocabulary choice, or pronunciation, or grammatical variance. These are the things that make someone's manner of speech unique to them, something that's easily identifiable and recognisable that you can attribute to one person. The main two characters I'd like to look at a bit more closely in this regard are Guy and Layla. We'll look at Guy first. He's one of your main party members, but off the top of my head he doesn't have more than a handful of lines in the whole game, and when he does speak, it's like this. Chimera after egg. In order to try and make Guy stand out, his dialogue has been simplified to the point where it's almost insulting. You learn at another point in the game that despite his laconic manner of speech, he can actually speak to animals. As a trope, this feels kind of… recognisable, like a friendly but linguistically stunted gentle giant type. There's a novelization of Final Fantasy II which tries to explain this by saying that Guy was raised by animals, but even so, it just isn't the impression that comes across. Instead, the vibe you get from him is something more along the lines of Lenny from Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men. This is an example of an idiolect that is not convincingly written. There's really no reason for him to speak this way, and the tropes that the character and idiolect are both built upon don't exactly come across as if they've been done in good faith, to be honest. A character who's been thought through slightly better is Layla, a pirate who also joins your party temporarily. Although Layla's manner of speech definitely comes across as stereotypical as it could possibly be, it's still a decent attempt in my opinion. The reason why it works despite being a stereotype is this. Interestingly, what we understand to be pirate dialect in modern media is actually an ersatz version of what it was imagined to be back in the 50s. If you're from the UK, you'll be able to notice a lot of similarities between a stereotypical West Country accent, like an accent from the southwest of England for anyone who doesn't know, and the manner with which pirates tend to speak. This is because of an actor called Robert Newton, who decided to portray the character Long John Silver in the 1950 film adaptation of Treasure Island with a slightly affected West Country accent. Since then, it's become the norm. This is a slightly more light-hearted way of proving my earlier point about the tangible effect media has on society. Anyway, the southwest of England does actually have a history of piracy, which has been slightly trivialised over time, a fact evidenced by the existence of Gilbert and Sullivan's Pirates of Penzance, but all of this does provide an understandable basis for Layla's idiolect. It succeeds off the bat, because it is easy to believe, solely from how she speaks, that she is a pirate. It's amazing how simple this stuff is, really. Because the universally known pirate accent is essentially made up, it's kind of difficult to say that an imitation of it is hackneyed, because the point kind of is that it's hackneyed from the start. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, time to move on to something totally different. No stupid segue this time. I discussed the combat and progression systems right at the beginning, and we're going to head back to that kind of realm and discuss dungeon layout and design. Encounter rates in this game are a smidge too high, and from my experience, dungeons were usually slightly above or below the right amount of balance difficulty-wise. It almost never seemed to be quite right. That being said, they were certainly more interesting in their aesthetic design compared to Final Fantasy 1, using a lot of engaging and varied locales. As for more practical design, not too much changed from Final Fantasy 1's multiple branching paths, aside from a slight increase in dungeon complexity and size. However, the worst part of the whole dungeon experience is the new idea of having multiple doors to choose from, like we're playing that one game in Takeshi's Castle. Look at this example on screen. You have a few doors to choose from. One will lead you to either chests or the exit to the next floor, and the rest will lead you dead into the middle of an empty room with an encounter rate that's through the roof. I don't like being exclusively negative about stuff, really, there's usually some sort of silver lining to find, but I just can't see a positive in this, and it plays a significant role in most dungeons throughout the game. The only outcome I can possibly envision from instating this idea into a dungeon is frustration. I'm aware that Final Fantasy 2 came out really soon after Final Fantasy 1, and I don't want to be too harsh, but this is maybe the worst thing about the game. It's not reductive to call it a guessing game, where you're far more likely to be wrong than right, and you get punished in terms of both fun and time for being forced to guess. 
I would understand this more if there was some kind of clue system, for example, like a wee waystone somewhere on the floor that would give you a hint as to which door was right, or something along those lines to add another element to it. That way, you could have the choice of either exploring to find out which door to take, which would serve to add the length to dungeons that this was trying to, by the way, or you could actively decide to risk it, entirely of your own volition. That way, it doesn't come across like you're being forced to be wrong. Here's an improvement, though. Whereas Final Fantasy 1 had a system in which the space in front of a treasure chest would be a repeatable fixed encounter, Final Fantasy 2 uses a monster-in-a-box system, so that when you open certain chests, you're forced into a fight. The initial benefit you get from this modification is that the fight only happens once. Although these spots could be useful for level grinding in Final Fantasy 1, they were predominantly an annoyance, and you'd occasionally find yourself doing the same fight at least twice, just trying to navigate the area. The forced encounters in 2 are similar to 1's, in the sense that they're trickier than the average enemy. It's just nice to have them contained now. One element of dungeon design that I find pretty fun though, is the hidden walls. Sometimes you come across rooms that seem impossible to enter, but there's always a way in, like you can see on screen. If you know the dungeon layouts already, or if you make some educated guesses, you can save a bit of time in some dungeons, later ones especially, thanks to this feature. I like it because there's no negative to it, it's only there for your benefit. I think that this is the first example of one of these walls in the Dreadnought, and it gives you sufficient information to figure out that you must be able to get in somehow, and when you get in, now you know that this is something to look out for. It's good design actually, because it teaches you through action. Plus, if you never twig this, it doesn't really matter. You don't miss out on that much. The best part about the dungeons in this game though, above all else, is the music. The normal dungeon theme isn't particularly noteworthy, but Uematsu brought out the big guns for two brilliant dungeon-specific tunes. Here's the first one. And here's the second one. Both of these songs are amazing. The Rebel Army is the most quintessentially Final Fantasy II song, but these two here are without a doubt my personal favourites. The main reason why I think these songs are so brilliant is that they play in the two most tense dungeons in the game, and because of the songs, it makes those narratively important dungeons really stand out, and additionally it makes me enjoy the dungeons more in retrospect. Pandemonium is the final dungeon in the game, and to be fair, I, I quite like it anyway, actually. It's a really cool setting, it probably has the best difficulty balance of any of Final Fantasy II's dungeons, and there's plenty of cool stuff to find, but it still has far too high an encounter rate and is arguably a smidge too long. But it's just every time you get into a fight and it finishes, you just… you get to start listening to the song again, I mean what a privilege. I've heard complaints about this soundtrack before, but I think that some of the songs here are the first instances of Uematsu developing his specific sound. No one else at the time could have written Pandemonium, for example and it's amazing to be able to actually experience the gameplay which accompanies some of the songs which helped Uematsu develop into, in my opinion at least, the greatest video game composer of all time. Anyway, there's one character left to discuss before I talk about the ending, and that character is our missing party member from the beginning, Maria's brother, Leon. Throughout the story, you repeatedly run into this Dark Knight character working for the Empire. At one point Maria recognises his voice, and it ends up being Leon. Surprise, surprise. The way the game sets this up is as if it's supposed to be a really shocking reveal, but it actually ends up being very flat from start to finish. Leon gets taken by the Empire at the start, ends up one of their top soldiers, and after a bit of drama with the Emperor, essentially defects back to your side. The blueprint sounds like it has the capacity to be interesting, but it isn't. Ever. Because Leon disappeared from the start, and the characters never speak about what kind of person he is throughout the story, I don't give a shit about him. When you meet him near the end and finally talk to him, he's a really unsympathetic character too. Honestly, he means no more to me than any other random NPC, and he's supposed to be your final party member. What could fix this, at least partially, 
as if we were given some sort of explanation for why he changed sides, and rose so high in the Imperial Army so quickly. Was he brainwashed, or what? We never learn anything about that, and at the end we just take him back into the party, because he decided that committing heinous war crimes had gotten a bit old. Final Fantasy II gives you no reason to care about him or sympathise with him. This bit could have all been thought through a lot better. It does feel slightly backwards that you will end up caring more for every guest party member except him, the one you're probably meant to care about most. How little an impact he makes does negatively affect the game, and makes you question Final Fantasy II's party system. Generally, as a rule, I don't want to speak too much about future Final Fantasy games before I've covered them, but there's a reason that almost all main series games after this focus on either a small fixed party, or a consistent cast you can rotate. There are only a few times that come to mind of guests playing a significant role, like Beatrix in 9, and a few different characters in 12. This is one of those things that plays into the idea that a lot of Final Fantasy II was an experiment. They just threw loads of nets out and hoped that they all caught something. This is one of those that probably came back mostly empty. But yeah, here we are at the ending, pretty much. I've mentioned the game's primary villain, the Emperor, a few times now, and the basics are that you beat him. That part's pretty simple, but there's two things surrounding the defeat of the Emperor which are a bit more noteworthy. The first is the setting of the ending, the build-up to it. You actually kill the Emperor twice, once as a normal human, and then as a demon lord. The final dungeon we chatted about earlier, Pandemonium, is essentially a castle from hell. I can't help but appreciate the brazen simplicity in using Hell as the basis for the villainy in this game, and also that Pandemonium, a blatant reference to the capital of Hell in Milton's Paradise Lost, is the name of his dungeon. Having to trek into Hell to kill the villain on his own turf is just quite satisfying, and there's even a wee sign on the way into Hell. I think this whole bit is absolutely ludicrous in how simple it is, and somehow I think it's also the exact reason why it's good. It's like what I said earlier about Final Fantasy II having very little grey area. The Emperor ends up being the Lord of Hell? Of course he does, he's a bad guy, it makes sense. However, this lack of grey area also leads into the other and final point I wanted to make. Even though you win and overcome those aforementioned insurmountable odds, it's not as relieving as you'd expect. To be fair, the ending is the only time that anything good happens in Final Fantasy II, without something worse peering around the corner. But the scars left by the Empire aren't gone. The amount of time and effort it would take to regain even a semblance of normality in this world is verging on incalculable. It's almost bittersweet, like, we finally won, but at what cost? It's a significantly better ending than Final Fantasy 1's because you get a bit of closure. It is still a bit, I don't know, clumsy in how mechanically it tries to wrap things up for each character, but the idea behind it all is a step in the right direction for the series. I especially like the bits where you see all of your fallen comrades, though. It is a bit of a cliché, but I still like it. Before we head into the conclusion, there's a few things I wanted to really briefly mention but couldn't really fit in. For example, there's a character called Sid in this game, who started the trend of each Final Fantasy having a character called Sid, but there isn't much more to say about it than that. Another thing is that the character portraits are almost directly lifted from Yoshitaka Amano's concept art for the game. These are interesting things to know, and it's all stuff I still wanted to tell you, but I just couldn't find a place to put them in and have it feel like it was well integrated or sufficiently analysed. Funny enough, that's a pretty nice metaphor to use in trying to sum up Final Fantasy II as well. There's so much that this game tried to add, tried to fit in, and not all of it managed to slide into place as smoothly as other parts. Almost everything we've discussed so far, every main component of Final Fantasy II, shares the commonality of being new, and for the time, quite experimental. A thought I had as I was playing through this again, capturing the footage, was that there's something unusual about the second entries in major series like this. Mario 2, Zelda 2, Castlevania 2, even Metal Gear Solid 2, are all black sheep alongside the other games in their respective franchises. All of the first entries in these series were successful, Final Fantasy included, and I think that that success acted as a platform for the developers to be a bit more experimental and push the boat out. As far as I'm aware, the general consensus is that people often prefer the games before and after this experimental second entry. Because, in the case of Final Fantasy 2 in particular, the ideas were bigger than what was possible in the game at the time. This is why I think that the narrative, the thematic elements, the tone, and the music, things that are to a degree less reliant on the technological side of things, are all really above par, whilst the more direct gameplay components such as the battle system, the progression and stat system, as well as dungeon design, are all below par. If you look at Final Fantasy II, as a lot of people seem to do, as being nothing more than a battle simulator, it's no wonder you'd come away from it thinking it wasn't great. But, and I say this aware of the fact that combat is a major component of a JRPG, that isn't the only thing that should be taken into account. 
I think a part of all of us believes that there's a slight degree of objectivity in our personal opinions towards games. But the reality is that all games, game reviews, game analysis, is firmly anchored in subjectivity. What matters for someone else might not matter as much for you, and that's okay, because everyone forms their own personal experience with each individual game. Typically, I care more about stories, themes, characterization, and above all, emotional resonance, than I do about perfect gameplay and flawless combat. I would much rather play a game with an exceptional story and underwhelming combat than a game with a rubbish story and excellent combat, for example. I'm not wrong to feel that way, and you wouldn't be wrong if you felt the opposite. This is why the discourse around this game confuses me personally, because I never see anyone talking about how brilliant a job this game does, especially considering it was the first proper attempt at a Final Fantasy story, in framing its narrative or developing its tragedies. A large part of this is because online culture and clickbait culture are both so heavily centred around negativity, which is a real shame and something that I wish we could more effectively quash. Sure, parts of Final Fantasy 2 aren't very good. But I think some parts of it really are, and if I have the option to, which I do, I'd rather focus on the positives. Well, there we go, that's us done. This was a really interesting video to work on. The game has much more going on than Final Fantasy 1 does, both mechanically and subtextually, and it was honestly really nice to have the opportunity to dive into Final Fantasy 2, and maybe try and talk about some of the things that you don't see too much in the general discourse surrounding the game. Now it's time to turn our attention towards Final Fantasy 3. It goes without saying that I'd like to give an enormous thank you to my wonderful supporters on Patreon. If you'd be interested in supporting me and the channel, as well as getting some benefits like being able to vote on polls regarding what videos I do, then please check it out. You can find the link in the description. So if you enjoyed this, please consider liking the video or subscribing to the channel if you aren't already. You can follow me on Twitter if you want more frequent updates from me, the link to that is in the description as well. I'd love to hear what you have to say in the comments, and if you could also share this video around with anyone else who you think might be interested, that would be absolutely brilliant. Thank you everyone, and see you next time.